In this part of the DVD, we will focus mostly on object tracking. So camera tracking should now be really, really clear. At least I hope so. Um, so one thing is tracking the camera, but the other thing is that you can also track objects because in theory, it is the same thing for at least for the camera. If you have, if you look through the camera, if you have the camera moving around an object like so, or if the object is moving or rotating. So for the solver, that is basically the same thing. So we can do this movement here with the object. And if you forget about the grid, maybe I can help you to forget about the grid by just simply turning it off in display and turn it off, also the lamp. So rotating the camera around this object is basically really the same thing as if you would rotate this object. So if, for example, you have a shot with a moving or rotating object, then you could just use the camera solver to solve that. And the result of that will not be a moving object, but instead the solution would be just a moving or rotating camera. Okay, maybe let's try that with an example. And for that, again, uh, you will have to watch my face for like the next hour. So in this shot, I have added some markers to my face and I want to add some glasses. Nothing fancy, so just boring glasses. And the important thing, if you are shooting something like this for yourself, is that when you are shooting this, that you don't move your face because these markers have to be totally static. Otherwise, you cannot get a solution from that. Now, in this case, we also have a moving camera, but for the solution, that doesn't really matter as long as we get a moving object on my face from that. Now, the footage is not really good because it was not very bright in this. It was actually in the Blender Institute, so it wasn't very bright. We had to close the curtains to lower the... Uh, the specularity on my face because that was too bright here. So the lighting conditions were not ideal. So this shot is really not that good. So we also have quite a bit of uh, noise and flickering. It is too dark and yeah, it's not very nice. But for tracking, it works. And that's what we're going to do for the next 45 minutes or so. So let's go to Blender and in the movie clip editor, click on open, then go to the folder with your footage. In that case, it is in object tracking, head track, and then just choose this, open clip, F for fit to view. It doesn't work in Blender 2.62, but in the current trunk, so the current development version, and also in Blender 2.63, that will work. F for fit to view, very handy. And I think we will just track until frame 250. So the shot is a little bit longer, but maybe we could just use the sequence or I don't know what happens after that. Okay, well, let's just use this the whole shot. So 280 will be the last frame. So E for end frame. And now we have two options. First option is to just start tracking right away and then create a camera solution just from these markers on my face, on my ear and on my head. And that will generate a moving camera. But I mean, it, the camera has been moving. So, well, if you have a camera like orbiting around my head like crazy, that would be weird. So it would make much more sense if you would actually have a moving object. And to create an object track, you will first have to add an object or like the, like the object slot, so to say. So to do that, you can go up here below the grease pencil, you have that object panel and the default object that is selected is the camera. So whenever you are adding markers here, these markers will belong to the camera. So with these markers, when you click on solve camera motion, well, they will generate a camera motion. But in this case, I want to have a moving object. So instead of using the camera, I click on the plus sign to generate an object. And that object is, well, let's just keep the name object. If you have multiple objects, then you can maybe give it a more meaningful name. But in this case, object is good enough. 
and then go to frame one and start tracking. Well, <laughs> just like as we would do if this would be a camera track. So that is nothing special. Just control click, add a marker, control T, start tracking. But well, in this case, it just stops because the footage is quite blurry and because of the ISO and the low lighting conditions, there's a lot of flickering. So the marker stops. Actually, it was not all too bad. So here we can just press G, enable it again, make sure that it still is on the right spot. And then with Alt right arrow, continue on tracking. Of course, L to center to the view. But well, again, it stops. So this is kind of hard to track. Maybe if you increase the size, it might become easier. But I think the biggest problem here is the setting of match keyframe. Match keyframe is nice in some shots because uh, it will avoid sliding because as soon as the keyframe doesn't match anymore, it will just stop. But in this case, I think the sliding will not be that big of a problem. Um, it will just help you to track this a little bit easier. So especially if you run the risk of having things get in the way suddenly, then you will run the risk of sliding if you set it to match previous frame. Uh, and that is when the match keyframe is really nice and handy. But in this case, there's nothing getting in the way. It's just that it would be nice if the marker would stay a little bit longer. So this is really not ideal. Tracking this whole shot with this setting would be very annoying. So instead for the next markers, I want to use the setting match previous frame. So that's fine. We can, if you want to, you can lock it off, but since we don't use the detect features feature, we don't need to lock it because we just won't touch it. So shift left arrow to go back to frame one. And then here in the tracking settings, um, maybe we can also set it to blurry footage that will make it a little bit larger, but most importantly, it will set it to previous frame, which is what we need. Okay. So control click next feature, control T. And now that tracks the whole sequence just fine. Although there is a little bit of sliding, so that is problematic. Well, so in this case, we also have to do some manual work. So especially blurry shots like this are always a little bit tricky and not so nice to solve. But still, I think that previous frame matching is in this case a little bit better and easier. And you can see that if I adjust the track or set back the marker, to a new position, then I also track a few frames in the opposite direction just to make the transition between the new keyframe and the previous ones a little bit smoother because now there is a sudden jump. So now tracking a few frames backwards from this position will smooth out that transition. Also here I set it back to that and then track a few frames backwards to smooth out the difference between the new position and the old one. And on this zoom level, you can also very nicely see all the blocks from the H264 compression. So all these squares are because of the compression and also the ISO and the very bad lighting. All right, but this marker should now be okay. So let's go back to frame one and continue tracking other markers. For example, this one. Control T and it does track, but it also slides away starting from this frame. So here I manually correct it in order to stop it from sliding.
All right. And well, now I will just continue on tracking. And at some point I will speed it up, not to bore you. Um, but I want to show you one more thing. And that is that you can also limit the track to a certain color channel. Because as you can see, the lighting is mostly in the red and green area. So there is very little blue in this shot. And if you go to the display settings, then you can also set it to black and white, which in some cases also helps to better be able to identify the contrast, but you can also disable certain color channels. And now if you set it to black and white and for example, disable the blue channel, then there's almost no change. So toggling the blue channel really doesn't have a big impact. But if I now toggle the red channel, that has a much bigger impact. And especially the green channel really makes a difference. So again, compared blue channel on and off, red channel on and off, and especially the green channel on and off really does make a difference. So let's have a look at these channels separately. Maybe we can also zoom in to better see the noise. So that is all three channels in black and white. Now I disable the blue channel, doesn't really make a difference. And if I also disable the green channel, then we only see the pixels of the red color channel. We can also go back and forth and there's quite a bit of flickering. So the quality is really quite bad of this footage. Now I disable red, of course now everything is black, but if I now enable the green channel, then still there is a bit of flickering, but also there is still some contrast between black and white. But if I now disable green and only enable the blue channel, then that really looks horrible. So if you look at this noise, that is really terrible. And especially the head that we want to track. And there's almost no difference between my skin and the markers in terms of lighting. So the blue channel really doesn't have a lot of information about the colors in this part of the shot. So tracking the blue channel is probably a bad idea just because there is so little information in it. So instead I just disable blue and track red and green. I mean red there is the most information in it but green also helps to smooth out the noise. But if I just disable them here in the display that will have no impact on the tracking. So instead we also have to enable or actually we have to disable the blue channel here in the track panel. So now if I disable that here then this track will only track on the red and green channel but blue channel won't have any impact. And you notice that here in the tracking settings, we can also as a preset disable the blue channel so that the next marker that I pick on frame one, something's going on, reload footage. Yeah. So that the next marker that I track here from frame one, control left click, this one might eventually be a little bit better because there's not the noise of the blue channel in it. So L to lock it and then control T to track that. And that went pretty fine. Even though there's still a little bit of sliding that we should try to avoid. So maybe if I make it a little bit smaller, keep on tracking. There, I think it was sliding a little bit. So we have to adjust that. It's just one of the tools that you can use to try to track something better. But here the feature is just gone, so we can leave it disabled at the next frame. And when I'm turning my head again, we can enable it again, like so, and track it a few frames back, and then keep on tracking forward until the end of the shot. There it slides, so bring it back on track. All right, and in this way, I will now try to cover as much of the footage as I can. So I will try to track this point, 
this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and maybe these two. But especially useful will be the markers that I have here on my ears, because you know we need as much perspective as we can get. So all these are more or less in one plane, maybe not the nose, but these ones are mostly on one plane. Then these ones are a little bit more in the back, but the real depth information here is on my ears. So these will be the most important markers to have, and because they are here in my ears and in these ear folds, they will be also tricky to track because of the lighting conditions and I'm turning my head and so on. So these will be a little bit tricky, but also they will give us a lot of perspective and that will really help to create this solution. So now I will track that and when I'm finished, we can start solving that.
That was quite a bit of work, and it was really quite tedious, I have to admit. But hopefully this helps us to nail down this track. So the next step would be to solve that, of course. First of all, maybe let's have a look at the tracks. So let's go to the curve hit select everything, and see if there's any sudden spikes. That looks dangerous, but maybe it's not that bad. No, I think that should be fine. The jumps are not too bad in this one, so hopefully we can get a decent solution from it. So, collapse that, collapse this, collapse that, collapse this, collapse... Oh, actually we need that. Then of course also the camera data. And first of all, let's set this to my camera, so the 550D. I'm not exactly sure about the focal length. Let's assume something about 21 millimeters. I'm not really sure. The thing is that when you are solving object motion, then there is no option for refinement. And that also makes kind of sense, because if you look at that, all the tracks are really here in the center of the scene, which of course is just in this case, but um, I would say that when you are doing object tracking, then most of the time, um, you will have a situation like this, where most of these features are really condensed in a small place and are not covering the whole thing. So calculating or automatically calculating the focal length and especially the distortion would be ridiculous to try that from this kind of trackers. So there's no refinement, so we really have to try to get along with our estimated focal length. Then the most important thing, as always, is to try to get the right keyframes. And I believe that might be maybe here, 145. And here maybe 106. Let's try that. <clears throat> like that, and now solve that, shift S. And 1.09 is really quite good for an object track. So let's see if we can get that better if we change the focal length. That is still the same. Let's try this. So it seems to be more something like 20 or 21. Or oh, actually that is getting better. Let's see with 18. Yeah, I think 18 is our focal length. So the next step, if we have this object solution, is to apply this solution to an object, of course. So first of all, let's drag this down, create the 3D viewport, and then there is something missing in my display. That is because I had disabled the grid floor. So now that we've got that, uh, we can start applying this to maybe this cube. Now, there is no button named Setup Tracking Scene, and that is because this is only related to the camera. And the thing about the object solver is that it needs to have a solved camera. Now, in this case, of course, the camera I mean, there's nothing to solve because we don't have any data. But nevertheless, you have to apply the camera solver constraint to the camera. That sounds weird, but currently that's just the way it is. So add constraint, camera, solver, without doing anything. And there you go. There's the solution. So you can see the points. And if you move the camera, then the points will follow because the object is related to the camera, even though it would have a known solver. But the points in 3D space that are moving here are in fact related to the camera. So now we can manually move the camera wherever we want. For example, you could say, let's move it down here so that it's a little bit more in the center. You can also do it from quad view, but that is really not really that important. I mean, that is after all, that is just the orientation of the camera. But if I look at my scene, then in fact we have this room here, this line. So I guess the camera has in fact been 
rotated in a similar way like this, maybe not so steep. So with my 3D cursor here at the origin, I enable 3D cursor as pivot point and then hit R, X, X, because that will rotate the camera around the local X axis and thereby I can make the angle a little less steep. And maybe it would also help if you would actually see the scene so that we can manually orient that. So here I scroll down to the bottom and then say set as background. And now that we have the clip in the camera perspective background, we can now also orient that. So R, Z like that. I think that makes sense more or less. And no, oh, actually, I think that makes sense. That looks quite all right. Of course, the camera is moving, so that doesn't fit to the uh, scene anymore. But the point is that we have now these 3D markers. So with that, we have to apply an object, of course. And since we already have an object, which is this cube, of course, we can just apply the object solver to this cube. So with the cube selected, Let's go to the constraint panel and add the object solver constraint like that. And still nothing happened. And that is because we have to fill in some data. For example, we have to fill in the object, which is object in this case, and the camera. Eventually that could be automated, but currently that is the way it is. And you can see that the object has now moved to this position and of course, we can now also manually move that in the local axis like so, but you can also set an origin, for example. So let's say we want, let's say we want my nose to be the origin of the scene, for example, this point right here. Then it would make sense if the cube would also have the origin, maybe here at this line. So first, I go to edge select mode and then select this edge, shift S3 to put the cursor here and then in object mode origin to 3D cursor like that. And now we can make use of this point by going to the movie clip editor, going to reconstruction mode, then pick this point and say set origin. So now the origin is exactly at this point and if you look through the camera then it in fact is at that point and it follows perfectly my head. Now the rotation is of course a little bit weird and in this case I would just manually rotate that with RZ, maybe in wireframe mode and you can also scale it down. But if you know the distance then you can also use the reconstruction mode to manually set the distance between two points. So for example my ears could be maybe 20 centimeters or 30, I have no idea. So if I go full screen, you can see that in the orientation panel of the reconstruction of the object solver mode, you have the scale and the scale factor in this case also applies to the scene. So if you in fact would have a camera solution, then this distance would set the global scale for the camera and the camera scene. But if you want to set the scale of the object, then you go to the object panel and then you also have two options to set the scale. And the distance in this case is also related to two markers. So for example, we can select these two markers and set distance is 0 0.3. Set scale and that should scale down everything so that the distance between these two points equals 0 0.3 blender units. And you notice that the cube has been automatically scaled as well. So if I now disable the object solver for a second, then the cube is back at its original size. So that has now set the scale to these two points, but you don't always know exactly the distance between these points. And even if you know that, it might not fit for some reason. And in that case, you can use the scale and the scale factor here is like sort of a tweak mode where you can manually tweak the distance. And if you want to place the object at a certain point in your scene, then you can use the scale to, well, set a scale arbitrary for this object. Okay, but now 
I think it's just a matter of aligning this cube with my face. So this is my chin. And maybe I can also make the markers a little bit smaller. So set the size down to something like this. So these two are my chin. And I want to rotate the cube so that it matches that shape. So I rotate it like this. So that matches now more or less the plane between my forehead and the chin. Like so. Then we can make this a little bit longer, smaller, also this of course. Edge loop, make it bigger and eventually rotate a little bit around the local y-axis. So R, Y, Y. Like so. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And now if I hit Alt-A for playback, then this cube is now following perfectly my face. Okay, so what I can do now is to render myself with a beautiful cube on top of my face, which is not that interesting. Although a cube with ears, I mean, <laughs> it's also not bad. Since we already have all these markers, maybe we can use them for modeling. Now, of course, what we can do is to go into edit mode and then manually snap every of these vertices to one of these 3D markers, but that is super tedious. And there's a way to convert these into a 3D mesh. And for that, you should go to frame one because otherwise it won't work. So go to frame one and again, I have a little problem here with my updating movie clip, which I believe is really only happening on, on OS X, weirdly enough. So I've tried on Linux and it works much better than here. Anyway, so reloading always helps. Okay, on frame one, I want to convert all these markers, including the ones that I don't see. So Alt D to also show the disabled tracks. So all of these markers, should be converted to a 3D vertex. And you can do that in the reconstruction panel if you activate 3D markers to mesh. And maybe I do that while seeing the 3D viewport. So if I click 3D markers to mesh, then somewhere down here, there appears a mesh out of vertices. Um, but well, Currently, it is not following the object and it is on a very strange position. And to fix that, you could either clear the rotation scale and uh, location of the camera, because that is at point zero, and if the camera would be also in point zero and not rotated, that would now fit. But you can also just copy the rotation, location, and uh, rot location, rotation, and scale of the camera by using the copy attributes add on. And that is an add-on that I would recommend to have enabled all the time because it is super useful. So here in add-ons, right here at the top, activate the copy attributes menu. And then if you first select the object that should receive the attributes and then shift right click select the object that you want to get the attributes from, which is in this case the camera, then you can press Control C, then copy location, copy rotation, and copy scale. Now, unfortunately, the scale in this case is not on the camera object, but on the object. So that would be this cube. But also this cube has um, the distance stuff going on. So we have to do a manual copy of a certain scale value. And that scale value in this case is the scale factor of the object. So that is 1.1809. So bring the mouse over this value, hit Control C, and then with the mesh selected, this one, go to the scale, and then Control V, Control V, Control V. And now the mesh has the same scale factor as the object, 
And if you hide the motion tracking, then you can still see these points, but these points are now an actual mesh. So we can grab these, go into edit mode, and convert these to faces by selecting them and hitting F. And now we've got a face on my face. And if I go forward, is there another one? No. But as you can see, it is still not following my head. So even if I now fill these up and create a nice face on my face, it's still not following, but that is easy to fix. Either you could go to the constraints and add the object solver constraint. Like that. Or, and I think that is easier, when you first test with the cube, Alt-H to unhide that. So if you have this kind of test object that you can use to test if the track is fitting, then you can bring that to another layer. For example, the last layer. That is one layer where you can just put all the junk that you don't need, but that is still useful. So I can now select this object, then shift select the cube, hit control P, set parent to object, and then only activate layer one. And now we have that shape following my head. Now the origin in this case of this head is here at the camera which is not very helpful. So maybe we can also just set the cursor here and then here origin to 3D cursor. And it will still follow. So that is one way how you can generate a mesh that you can use to do all kinds of stuff. So I can just go on modeling, close this shape. So now I have something in front of my mouth, but I mean, it's not very detailed, of course. So even though we can go on modeling here, that is really just a very rough shape, um, which we can of course detail manually by inserting loop cuts, using the knife tool, rotating these shapes and thereby maybe getting the shape of my nose right and then continuing on closing these. But well, it's, it's not very detailed. But as a start, it can be very, very useful. And especially if I would just want to have one part of my face, then you can really use these. And for example, close that. Um, you notice I'm using B mesh here. So um, that is not really familiar. Okay, yeah, now I have to press J and that will create these triangles, which I can then use to make this shape a little bit rounder like that, which is not very accurate. But if I would just want to have a logo on my forehead or anything, then this would be really enough. Okay, so that's how you can create a mesh from markers. But for what I want to do, I really have to create a digital double. And of course, I've already done that. And in the next part of this tutorial, I will import that and then see what I can do with it.